Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to share with you all this morning that we've really been praying for our time together. We've been praying for you all. It's so important to come together as a family of believers and to experience this together, to sing praise and worship to God, to give God glory through music and scripture and to come together to learn. I trust and I know and I believe that God has been speaking to Pastor Bruce this morning as he's been preparing what he's going to share with us. Um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to this, this church in Corinthians. So why don't we stand together as believers here in Didsbury? Um, I know that we're always called to worship and to, and to reflect on God, and this is just a small part of our week, but may this be a time of refreshing a time of intention that we can worship God and see him in his glory as we're singing and praising. I'm on. 
<clears throat> Welcome here. It's good to see you all here. Uh, as we gather in this place, as we worship together, we are grateful for the chance to share uh, what God is doing and some of the plans that we have for, uh, for the next little while that we want to share with you as well. And so you know that we are getting ready for Revelation for the rest of us. It's a book that um, Scott McKnight and Cody Matchett wrote, and it's uh, dealing with Revelation not so much in a you know, where does, where does this fit in and, and who is, you know, who is Babylon and all that kind of thing. It's, it's a bigger kind of a look at, um, at the book of Revelation. So we're excited about this opportunity and want to show you a little bit. This is uh, Cody Matchett giving us an invitation here. Hey, Zion Church. Uh, my name is Cody Matchett. If we have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting you this next weekend, April 12th and 13th, as we spend some time together over the Friday night and the Saturday, talking together about the book of Revelation, the final book of our New Testament, the Apocalypse of John. And so if you're interested in having conversations about the last book of the Bible, its relevance for our lives and our discipleship for today, if you want to dive into some of the, the big themes and ideas and movements of the book and how it helps us follow Jesus faithfully today, then I just want to invite you to come out, take some time on Friday night or Saturday, join in with us. We'll have opportunity to do some, some lecturing and some discussing on some of the texts, and then we'll always have time for questions and responses as we discuss together ultimately what it looks like to allow the book of Revelation to be a kind of manifesto for our discipleship today. So I look forward to seeing you this next weekend, April 12th and 13th. I just can't wait to be with you, to learn alongside of you, and to grow together. Sorry, we have two different... Uh... We're working off two different systems currently here. I think we're almost on track. Um, so next week, we, uh, we invite you to come on Friday and Saturday. And uh, it helps us to know how many uh, snacks to get and uh, sandwiches to buy. So please let us know if you are able to come. And if something changes, either you can't come or you decide to come, we'll make it work. So just looking forward to seeing you here on Friday evening. Um, I'm trying to get Shailene's and uh, Cole's, like I'm doing this right now, right? The announcement, and uh, tell me if I'm wrong on anything. So Cole and Shailene are excited because they are anticipating uh, adopting a sibling group of kids from the Philippines with, uh, there's a group of four of them. And so they thought, well, that can't be so hard. And so they decided to adopt four kids and uh, they are, preparing for these, uh, their family to arrive here and while well, they'll, they're planning for all of this to be worked out in like the next, could be five, six months, we don't know, right? But what they want to do is have a pre-celebration for all of us as a way to just say, we are all part of this journey. <laughs> and so we want to be included in this journey, and we want to celebrate what God has done. You will hear stories next week of what, how God has been working and orchestrating this. It's, it's an amazing story. And, uh, and they are hosting us where they are offering a pig roast for everybody that wants to stick around for a Filipino pig roast. And so... Um, it, uh, it will happen right after the service, but we all will bring uh, sides and salads and things, right? And uh, just do a potluck that way. But we are excited about this chance to hear a bit about their story. And also as a chance for them to kind of give us some cues, some instruction on, on what our role will be. And kind of how we navigate, you know, when, when these kids show up, do we... Do we go up and give them big hugs or what do we do, right? Like, so it's just trying to navigate, okay, so this is how it works and this is the role that we can play. So it's actually a very important time for us, but it's also mostly about a celebration of what God is doing in their lives. Uh, today is, um, it's today, is April 7th, is a family swim time at the Didsbury Pool. I was just thinking about this because it's also the trade show. So you can go and look at the scooter guys booth and then have your kids go 
to the uh, family swim time as well, from two till four. And so all this means is that we had been given money from the town a long time ago for a different project. We ended up not using that money, and so we thought, well, why don't we just use that for the town? And so that's why we're sponsoring these, uh, these swim times. So if your kids are looking for something to do today, you can join in on that. It's not simply our rental. It's actually for the whole community, which is very cool. And then tonight we have the Aspen Ridge uh, Lodge service is at 6.30. And so we welcome you to come and join us at Aspen Ridge Lodge. And it's about a half an hour and a chance to interact with some of the residents up there who are watching us as I speak now. And uh, that will be important. Uh, also, real quick, just a heads, heads up, we'll give you more details in the future. But Peter and Lonnie had a baby, Jacob, who's not here today. No. Okay, we'll get Jacob here yet. Um, anyway, uh, they, um, we're going to be having a shower for them uh, on April 28th, it sounds like, uh, at 1230, so after church on April 28th, but more details to come. Just as we, uh, all of a sudden I'm standing here for a very long time, <laughs> but I have many things to share with you that are going on. And I just want to shift gears uh, briefly into more of a family update. Um, first of all, you know that Theo Neeson, her memorial is on Friday at one o'clock here at the church. And uh, so if you'd like to uh, be a part of that, um, that's happening at one o'clock. But um, I just had news from Marion Craycamp this morning that her husband, Philip, passed away yes, last evening. And um, some of you will know them. Uh, they used to attend the missionary church here for years and then most recently have been at Crossfield. And, uh, but anyway, Marion is, is here this morning and we're, um, we're just... She says that they are praising God for the sense of peace and just knowing that, that Philip is home with his Savior is, uh, is a blessing. And so... They're grateful to God for all that's happened, and uh, we just want to be praying for Marion and her family as they have much to work out in the next few days. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you, that we can lift up your name, Father, that we can uh, enter into worship together, that you join us together as a family. And so we pray for all of these things that are coming up. We pray for uh, Cole and Shailene as they anticipate uh, this family that they will become and uh, that you will guide all these decisions and that your timing will be um, very evident and clear. Lord, we thank you for the gift of children. We thank you for the gift of life. But we also recognize that we have a gift of eternal life. And so we are, are grateful that Philip is experiencing that now with you. And so, Father, would you be with Marion and her family as they work out many details this week? Would you give them strength and peace during this time? And we continue to pray, Lord, for Harold Weber as he's been in a lot of pain this week, um, back and forth to different hospitals. We just pray for your hand of mercy and protection to be on them for Yvonne and, and her family as they have some, uh, some decisions that they're making right now about future treatment. We just uh, commit them to you today as well. So Lord, as we've come to worship, as we're singing, would you guide us through this time that we would be drawn into your presence in a very powerful way. And so we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, oh, Ken is saying, don't forget the offering. Okay. So let's call the ushers up, and we'll uh, take this morning's offering. And um, hey, did you know that if I was just in Ontario this week, did you know that if you live in Ontario, you could have had tomorrow off? Did you know that? Because there's the eclipse, right? Were you aware of that? And so workman's compensation is saying that, that uh, companies are at risk if their employees get blinded while they're at work on, during an eclipse. I am not making this up. And so uh, they decided to give a bunch of people the day off. So, oh, to be in Ontario right now, right? All right, let's go. I just think we're so tough here in Alberta that they know 
that we can handle it. But um, why don't you stand with us? We'll continue our worship. It just kind of struck me as Colin was praying for people in our community. It's such a blessing to be prayed for. You know, we've prayed for each other. I know you've prayed for me and my family, and we've prayed for you. What a blessing. There's people out there that aren't prayed for on their behalf. So I'm just, you know, as we're preparing, I've been meditating on what um, Pastor Bruce is going to share with us, and it's all about just this family of believers coming together. There's nothing new under the sun. We have the same struggles and temptations as the early church did, as the Adam and Eve did, and yet God can redeem everything, and it's so important to come together. So I'm just really grateful to be here together with you all, but we'll continue in worship. Till he 
beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you name of Jesus.
free to sit if you'd like or
If there's one guarantee in life, it's that there will be suffering. And it took me 35 years to learn or find out or for God to show me that he's not going to remove the suffering. That's not what makes him good. What makes him good is that he's with us through anything and everything. Man, thanks for leading us in that one, worship team. Father, we thank you so much that we have this place that we can gather together, that we can come uh, bask in your presence, acknowledge your goodness, reflect. Old habits. Thank you for this community that we can come be with on Sundays. Hopefully, we're uh, getting together in life as well, but... Thank you for this support system, for this community, for this, uh, for this building. Uh, thank you for the leadership of Colin and Bruce and team. Thank you that you are at work in our lives, whether we see it or not. Thank you that you go before us preparing the way. Thank you that you are with us each and every step and that you uh, will never forsake us. Yeah. Be with Bruce as he brings the message today, uh, strengthen him, uphold him, soften our hearts to hear your word. May we pay attention to what it is that you have for us uh, today in particular, every day but today. And uh, may we continue to learn by your grace what your goodness means. Yeah. In your name I pray. Amen. Sometimes I need to not sing so that I can hear the truth of the words that you're singing. Is that true for you sometimes too? Because sometimes I just sing them. And I uh, just really appreciate the worship team for leading us this morning in the truths about Christ and who he is. Um, there is no one like him, right? He is our great God. Um, so, we are going to talk about the church. It's going to be a little bit about our church, but over the next weeks, it's going to be about a first century church in Corinth. And uh, I was supposed to put a map of where that is, but I know everybody knows where Corinth is, so I didn't put the map in. Um, it's in Greece. It's just on the uh, uh, west side of the kind of little isthmus, which is like a 25-kilometer stretch between mainland Greece and this little... It's not an island because it's connected, but Corinth is right there, and uh, it was one of the churches that uh, Paul went to. It's the fourth letter. Um, we have lots of Paul's letters in our Bibles, um, it's the fourth letter that he wrote um, after Galatians and First and Second and uh, Thessalonians. We're going to uh, be making um, just small group sheets, or you could have them as uh, personal studies um, every Sunday, except for this Sunday, um, for groups to use. Uh, if you'd like to be part of a group, you can give me or the church office a call or email. And we'll try to, to get you in one. I think it's one of the best places to get to know others. Um, this series will probably have a break uh, for summer, but we'll finish it in the fall. Just a lot of material to go through. Uh, Gordon Fee, a uh, commentator, says that 1 Corinthians is the second, is the single greatest theological contribution to understanding the nature of the church. Now, there's lots of other books that talk about it too. But just to say, this is one of the books of the Bible that's kind of a go-to as we're trying to understand the church. And we're going to learn some things about this church and maybe about ourselves as we go. 
Um, the gospel uh, itself is at stake in the Corinthian theology and behavior. They sometimes didn't act like the church at all. Um, and so what they said they believed didn't match up with what, how they were acting. Not just individually, but even towards each other. Uh, we're going to see that in the days to, to come. Um, uh, also, just the local community, everybody knew what was going on in the Corinthian church because they did it out loud, <laughs> whatever they did. And uh, sometimes that wasn't uh, too good. We'll see uh, that Paul describes the church um, over the book as a whole in at least two ways, these two ways. The church is God's temple in Corinth. And you have to remember that Corinth was uh, a huge city. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Um, like between 80 and 100,000 people uh, there with temples galore. <laughs> there was a temple to every god anybody could think of um, in Corinth. And so, um, but here the church is described. The church is not a building, right? It's the people. The church is described as a temple, God's temple in Corinth. And here too. The church is the body of Christ. We see that imagery later on in the book as well. And it was, uh, there's a necess necessity of unity, obviously, if you're a body, one group doing this stuff over here, and one arm doing another thing over there doesn't really work. Um, but there's a necessity of diversity as well. Not division, but diversity. So a little bit of background. If you were actually to want to know a little bit of the early beginnings of the church, you could find that in Acts chapter 18. Uh, because we see on Paul's second uh, missionary journey um, that that's actually where he went. We see there a synagogue leader who um, became a believer. And this is a Jewish synagogue, right? <laughs> and he became a believer, his whole household, and the rest of some of the Jews there in Corinth wanted to take Paul to task for leading him to, to the Lord, so to speak. And uh, Paul was protected by God, um, but the synagogue leader was beaten by these people, uh, beaten up publicly. And it's a, it's a crazy story there in Acts chapter 11. You'll also see that, that there's some pretty important people that we hear about, first Christians, very good leaders like Priscilla, Aquila, Apollos, um, those type of people were in that area of Co Corinth and part of that church. So this is the church we're going to be studying here in a bit. Um, a diverse population, again, between 80,000 uh, 80, and 100,000 people. Um, Rome in about 40 B.C. shut down and totally destroyed the city of Corinth when they conquered it. And in 50 years, they kind of built it up again. Um, lots of people that decided to be there were maybe ex-military or actually slaves of Rome. And so here's a very wide group of people um, from many different nation, nations. It's a um, trade route, very important. Got a huge harbor that was very important to trade. So just saying, this is even from North Africa and stuff like that. So Paul spent about a year and a half there teaching, and uh, he had a large group of people become Christians. Um, again, an economic center and a port city. Um, it was a religious center. I already said that there's many t temples to various gods, and lots of people used many um, of these gods or prayed and worshipped to many of these gods. After his time there, he went to Ephesus, 
And he was there for a little while, and he heard um, via the grapevine, because he had lots of connections, that things were not going well in Corinth. And uh, as the church was plagued with all kinds of issues, he wrote this letter to address these issues and even said that he was going to come back and help straighten some of these things uh, around. Um, the letter is made up of at least five short essays that initially describe a problem that needs to be dealt with and how Paul responds to the problem with the gospel. So we're seeing this kind of ebb and flow here. Here's what's happening, what I understand is happening, and here's what the gospel says and teaches um, about it. And so he uh, does that, and uh, it's both theological and practical. Um, it shows that they're not living out of what they believe or say they believe, and they need to live out every area of life, no matter where they are, what they're doing. And this is the same that we learn together in the Sermon on the Mount, um, that Jesus is saying to, uh, um, to everybody, hey, don't just hear what I say, but do what I've said to you to do. And uh, the First Corinthian church was having, having a bad time of it. So these are the things just kind of a splattering of some issues that we're going to talk about here um, in the next weeks and over into the fall as well. Um, there were s different church factions and splits. You ever heard of a church split? Yeah? Um, there were leadership attitudes. I, um, the people of the church, it wasn't that these leaders were trying to make names for themselves, but the people of the church said, I want to I like this guy better than that guy. So if there was house churches or something, we don't really know. But there was factions all over the city um, of different groups. And they said out loud um, why they liked this teacher or leader better than the other and what was messed up with that other group. Out loud, all the time. Everybody knew, um, including those that didn't go to church at all. Um, Christians were suing other Christians in law courts. There were issues of sexual immorality, marriage, divorce, remarriage, um, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, some comments that Paul makes about these things, freedom to participate in pagan rituals. Um, they would say, um, we're free in Christ, right? We're, Jesus gives us freedom. He's freed us from, so we can do whatever we want because we're free to do whatever we want. That's what they did. Um, gender and worship issues come up. Lord's Supper observance, spiritual gifts, importance of Christian love, and the resurrection of the dead. So how do we rate as a church compared to that? Um, we're kind of seeing a mess of, uh, what kind of mess do we make? It's interesting. So I'm going to briefly go through the first 17 verses of uh, chapter 1 just to give us a little bit of a taste of what we're going to be walking through together. And I hope as you listen, um, you'll just, um, first of all, become curious, maybe reflective, um, that you'll read 1 Corinthians um, through several times over the next uh, weeks and months and just let God speak to your heart and where you're at and where maybe we are at as a church as well. So I'm not going to start right verse 1. I'm going to start verse 4, 1 Corinthians 1. And this is what it says. This is Paul speaking. He's writing it. Um, I always thank my God for all of you for the gracious gifts he has given us has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your uh, church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. So one of the first things I'd just like you to see here quick and brief is that Paul makes it very clear that Christ is head of the church. Okay, that's one of the statements he makes. 
Um, thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts that he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. And in some translations, it just talks about him being the, the, uh, the head of the church. So, um, in 1 Corinthians then verse 6, let's continue on. Um, this confirms that uh, what I was told about you is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says and he has invited you into partnership or fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, letting you know, this starts out really good. And it's actually not just a greeting. Paul's made a point of letting them know that there's some things that they're doing well. There's something where they're walking, they're doing good. Um, they have all they need to continue to do what God wants them to do, um, including having a partnership um, with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Know what that word partnership means? What Greek word it is? We have at least three schools in the area named after this. Koinonia is the, is the word. And it means, um, uh, denotes a participation, a fellowship, especially with a close bond. It expresses a two-sided relation of either giving or receiving. So, that sounds really good. That sounds like what the church needs to be. But, we get into verse 10 and we start hearing some of Paul's concern. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's saying, I have authority. God's given me authority, okay, over you. To live in harmony with each other. Let there be no division, divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. And so... Paul is actually in this first, in this one verse, begging the Corinthian church toward unity. He says, um, you all say the same, you should be talking the same way, saying the same thing, not having all kinds of different views or whatever. And then um, there should be no divisions. Um, that word in uh, Greek is schisma. What does it sound like? Schism. <laughs> now, we don't know about this a lot in evangelical churches, but the Roman Catholic Church in the uh, earlier centuries and even into the mid, uh, mid centuries, 1,000 to 1,200, would often talk about schisms. They would be church splits, things that one group would say, we believe this, so we can't be with you anymore. So that's what he's talking, that huge divide. Rather that you would be knit together in, this, in the same mind and the same opinion. Mind is your disposition, kind of your attitude. Um, have a good attitude, but my posture is going to be an attitude of being the same, being united. And then opinion and thought as well. Um, positively, uh, Paul urges uh, unity here. Um, the same, all of that. We have in our uh, vision statement as a church, uh, woven together is that part of it. And one of the values that we put there is being knit together. And it says this, uh, connected in relationship with our immediate local family and our extended global family, we endeavored to champion this kinship and collaborate wherever possible with churches, agencies, and individuals sharing the good news of Jesus. 
The word, uh, yeah, I already said that the word division is uh, schisma. And so um, just move on from there. Paul challenges the church in the name and the power and authority of Jesus that all would agree literally, meaning that they all say the same thing. Um, They must abolish divisions, um, so they got to get together and work this out. Um, Perfectly united, the verb uh, probably better rendered, restored to unity in mind and thought. So we need to take a step back for a second. Can you imagine, I don't know who it would be, Um, Maybe we can think of some of our forefathers. Um, Willard Swalm or something like that. Um, If he was still alive, coming in and calling us in Mountain View County and saying to all the churches, no matter what denomination, in Mountain View County, the people should come together and stop being divided by denominations and different points of view. And um, how would you feel about that? Anybody feel a little bit awkward? You might know of some other people or other churches that just don't quite believe the same thing that you believe, right? Am I right? Be uncomfortable with that? Um, Now, we believe close to the same thing as, say, Bethel Church and Carstairs. Um, I was going to be sarcastic, and I stopped myself. So you can ask me after um, after what that was about. Thanks, God. (laughs) Anyway... um, But there are some other um, churches around. We've got like um, First Baptist in Olds. I mean, I'm not saying some of us, our histories are with some of these other churches too. And I don't want to, you know, say too much about it. But don't you ever wonder why we can't get along a little better? (laughs) And... Why, why can't we maybe do more things together? What are we, what is this about? And I just, I want to say, it's because, yeah, some of the things that the Corinthian church sound quite outlandish, outlandish, but I think when we, when we uh, consider it, we might be a little bit closer and maybe uncomfortable with what he's saying about church. And what we have been part of. (laughs) I'm not saying that we've made it happen. I don't think Willard Swalm made it happen. I think it's been a history of trying to figure out sometimes biblically what we believe. And then somebody has a different view of that and this and that and all that. And we get uncomfortable and so we go our own way. But I, but I think it's good for us to just kind of feel awkward and uncomfortable with this for a bit. Um, are we one church? Could we be? Should we be? Um, we're going to talk about more about these divisions right as we get into verse 11. Listen to what this says, what Paul is writing. For some members of Chloe's household, now this isn't a tattletale, it's just a connection, good connection that Paul has, Um, with the church in Corinth, um, have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I'm a follower of Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. Boy, I got to tell you, we live in a culture, don't we, of kind of getting 
what we'd like. It's called consumerism, right? <laughs> We're going to go looking um, for what we'd like um, to have in a car, in clothes, in food, um, whatever. That's our culture. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. But sometimes if we bring that posture into, and I'm going to talk about this at the end a bit more, um, into our spiritual life, our, our following of God, it can be like, and it doesn't take much, and I'm going, I'm not sure I like it here anymore. <laughs> and we're going to go find a place that we kind of like better. Right? Are you feeling awkward and uncomfortable yet? Okay. Boy, I... And don't get me wrong, there are some places um, that maybe you've been or you know of people that have been that maybe they aren't preaching the gospel and we need to be (laughs) careful about that, right? But boy, just kind of... Put it on pause there. I need to when I'm going like, this is a mess, church, man. We're way better than this. I don't know. Let's think about that. Then he goes into verse 14. I I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. For now no one uh, can say that you are baptized in my name. Oh, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. Um, For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. Now, I need you to know something about the people that were being named in this kind of list of faction leaders, so to speak. It wasn't them, but Apollos was known to be a very, very good communicator and teacher, um, even more than Paul in that time. So isn't that interesting that uh, it's like the Corinthians heard a podcast of Apollos, and they're going, he's my guy. Man, <laughs> this guy's way more interesting than uh, Bruce or I don't know who else. Well, there's another guy that preaches here too. I can't remember his name. Um, But just think about that. Is this something that we need to be careful with? And I am not saying that there isn't good teaching. We certainly have been given a lot of privileges in our current uh, culture, right? To be able to hear all kinds of people um, from all kinds of directions that I think often add, but boy, we can get stuck into, I'm going to find the guy that agrees with me instead of somebody who's actually trying to challenge and move us along the road towards Jesus. Amen? Okay. Um, Certainly, uh, the Corinthian disunity was marked by recurring arrogance and immaturity. In fact, they actually thought that they were mature. They did. And it was almost like they believed that once you were saved, that was you derived. You didn't. The transforming process of sanctification, um, we've called it, um, didn't really need, we, we're done. We just, we're good Christian people and we can just carry on the way we want. It's kind of like that. There's a natural tendency of humanity to play down the challenge of the gospel and overemphasize its comfort. Get that? We think that there's lots of good in it for us and we're going to grab it. But those challenges, those things that we have to work at, do we really? Do we want other churches to succeed? 
in reaching their communities for Jesus? This community for Jesus? <laughs> That's a different kind of posture. The factions in Corinth became isolated and combative, putting each other down rather than encouraging and serving each other. In verse 17, I won't read it again, but um, paves a way for the discussion that's going to happen over the next four chapters in, in uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, there's this thing about human versus uh, um, clearly ideas and understanding from God. So a discernment. Um, that's hard work. Discernment is hard work. Um, that which claims to be Christian but is at best immature and at worst downright false because it is not gospel-centered um, versus genuine mature Christianity that um, with the gospel at its heart. And Christ is at the heart of the gospel. Don't take that away. I'm just using that as a broader term. Um, what would have stunned the Corinthians is that as it would be for us were to be for anybody to claim that their brand of Christian faith is immature. That would have stunned them. Hmm. You see, church is not a popularity contest. Church is a community of people who are centered around Jesus, around what he taught and lived. The gospel is not um, just moral advice or a recipe for an individualized, make it on your own spirituality. I don't think that many of us realize how much we've allowed our culture to shape the meaning of the gospel in the Bible, our Christian worldview. Do you believe that you are tainted by the culture you're living in as far as what you think and believe? Do you believe that? If you answered yes, good. <laughs> Because that means you're at least aware that that has some part in what you believe and what you do. And there needs to be some work done in that, in that way. Um, at times we can be living out a belief that is counter to what the Bible teaches. Paul is calling us to remember the truths that Jesus taught and lived and live them out ourselves with others as John Mark Comer says in his book, um, Practicing the Way, be with Jesus, become like him, and do as he did. The gospel in 1 first, in first Corinthians is an announcement about Jesus that opens up a new reality. That's what it is, a new reality, the reality that God is who he says he is in, the, in his word, that we are who he says we are in his word. That we are called to be united. John 17, read it sometimes. It sounds like Jesus is just pleading with the Father in prayer that we would be united and one and love each other. Whatever it takes. seeing every part of our lives through the gospel, every neighbor, our own families and homes, our work, our school, everything like that. Now, I have a guy, his name's Glenn, uh, Craig Blomberg, who gives a scathing commentary on the modern North American church. I think he's just talking about the Americans, but we'll read it anyway, okay? <laughs> Uh, no, sorry for you who are from the States. I'm going to have to apologize for that one. Um, email Colin about that. 
And uh, anyway, this is what he says. And it's a little bit of a run through, but just take it in. You can get, a, get uh, my notes afterwards if you want to look at it again. He, he says this, we see much behavior that closely parallels the immorality and I demand my rights attitude that is so characterized in Corinth. Is that true of the church? North America? That whole right thing is a great cultural <laughs> um, part thing. Secular standards of leadership um, also plague our churches. Um, we can learn models of planning and efficiency from the business world, but we err when we leave no room for the spirit and we fail to exhibit compassion and forgiveness in personal relationships. Often, margins of profit or loss replace the demands of the gospel in determining our priorities of ministry. We have replaced Christianity with idolatry. That's a fairly strong statement, isn't it? Is that us? And then he says, we have made a prioritized farm form of Christianity that relegates faith to individual quiet times and insulated church activities, but has little impact on the workplace, the public arena, or observable morality and holiness. Yeah. It's kind of all about us. Have we hidden our faith in God and replaced it with self-centered, I want what I want, I, I do what I want, I get what I want when I want it, I, I, I. We turn a negative eye towards the heresy of the health and wealth gospel, right? Yet we can sometimes believe that we should get anything we want from God instead of giving him all he wants. That church shopping type of a thing that we can talk about, it's really kind of a consumer issue in many ways. We actually can move to another church um, without doing the hard wrestling that it takes to walk through what might be a problem of why we're leaving. <laughs> the previous church. Again, I'm not saying that there aren't some reasons um, for making that kind of a change. But I think we just got to figure it out now. Let me just close with this. Friends, 1 Corinthians is going to help us see the church is at its worst and the church as Jesus desires. So at its worst, it's messy, hurtful, self-absorbed, ugly. Boy, there's lots more I could put on there. The church, as Jesus desires, is also messy. It is. Because it's a place where humility is learned, forgiveness is wrestled through, Love, loving one another is hard when it takes the level to what Jesus was calling it. Think of others before yourself. It's a place of training and it's beautiful. So, I'm glad that Colin gets to speak next week and uh, bring all of this into... <laughs> <laughs> um, just the rhythm of what the church and the issues that it faced and how Paul didn't give up and Jesus didn't give up and God, God wants his church no matter how messy it gets to continue to grow into becoming what he desires. Amen? It's true. So as the team comes up, let me just pray. Hope you'll be able to think about some of these things talk to each other, and uh, maybe, um, first of all, make a list of all the, the great things about 
<laughs> church that you've experienced. And then you can make kind of a list of, because we go to the negative right away, right? Boy, there's lots of good things that God has given us. I mean, you just had to be here last Sunday, right? To see baptisms and um, people wanting to stand and commit their lives to Christ for a lifetime. That's amazing. So, yeah, take that as a challenge. Um, Let's stand together, if you can. Thanks so much, God, for your word. (laughs) I pray that I haven't uh, um, confused it. I pray that your, your heart will be seen in all of this. You want your church, your bride to be all that it can be, to be holy and beautiful and loving, forgiving, inviting, all of these things. May it never become a place that's just about us and what we get. So thanks, Lord, for this uh, book of the Bible that you allowed us to get over thousands of years old. Thank you so much, Lord, that it has much to teach us, and may we listen for what your heart is in it. In your name, amen. Let's stay standing and sing. Yes, thank you so much for bringing that to us this morning. It's comforting to know that we can come to Jesus in our mess and humility, but through Christ in us, we can also do better. So that's also very hopeful. So we will, yeah, continue our our time here this morning with a last song.
much for being here with us this morning. And uh, I'd love to chat with you. If you've got, you've got some questions, um, I'd love to hear about uh, what somebody said to you um, without talking to me. No, I'm just joking. Um, yeah, I, you know what? I would love to sometimes end uh, times like this in the Word with some kind of hope. We always like the, the nice answer, but wrestle with it, okay? It's okay to wrestle with some of these harder things and let the Spirit show you and maybe um, some other people that you're walking along with uh, some things that you need to change. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. Our great God wants to be gracious to us. And may the Lord turn his face and give you his amazing peace. Go and continue to live as he would want you to live. Blessings upon you.